Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started with our webinar for this morning. Uh, my name is Ted Burke. I'm director of the Early Intervention Training Program, and I'd like to welcome you to the second session of our winter webinar series with the training program. Today we're going to learn about speech and sound development in toddlers, what's typical, and how do I support it. We're pleased to have today as a presenter uh, Shauna Ruzich, who is a speech language pathologist in our early intervention system. Shauna has a wide variety of background. Um, she's been in our field for over 18 years. She's the founder of SpeechTree um, in Illinois. Uh, EI practice in Illinois. She also is very involved on the state level with uh, ISHA. She's our Early Intervention Committee co-chair and on a number of other committees. And she's also part of the recently formed task force through the Department of Human Services that's looking at our service delivery model. And we're pleased that she's a trainer for us and a consultant for us with the Early Intervention Training Program. So we're happy to have her as our presenter for the session today. Also today, you'll be hearing from our moderators, myself, Ted Burke, and Maria Maddox, who will be, you'll be hearing happily for you more than you'll hear me on this call. Um, so Maria is a consultant with the training program as well. And if you participate in more than one of these, Maria is our moderator consistently throughout all of the sessions. So we look forward to uh, Hi, right, guys. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So let's get started. And um, after hearing today's presentation, I'm hoping that you'll gain an understanding of speech sound acquisition, understand what is typical and atypical, learn strategies to support the child and family. And based on our poll, I anticipated having um, many SLPs. And then I, I like to see the variety of interventionists, though. So that's wonderful. So where the speech language pathologist is the key person targeted for understanding speech sound acquisition and incorporation of strategies with the child and family, as an early interventionist and certainly as a parent, this information pertains to all of us in some way. The hope is that as a parent, as an early interventionist, You'll gain information that you can use within your intervention and, and at home that is friendly and functional and can be facilitated by anyone. So let's get started here. Okay, let's define language versus speech. These terms are often used interchangeably, but they are distinctly different. Language is what words mean. Language is how to put together words. Language is choosing the right words to get results. Language is learning how to make words. Speech is the verbal means of communicating. It consists of articulation or how sounds are made. I thought that was an adorable picture. <laughs> so what is articulation? It's the formation of clear and distinct sounds in speech, the articulation of vowels and consonants. Now, I don't suspect this little one is speaking clearly yet, but she certainly knows how to get her point across. I mean, look at that facial expression. So much of communication is nonverbal, but it is quite frustrating to a child having difficulties verbally expressing oneself. As articulation pertains to speech and what we are discussing today, the definition is obvious to us as providers, especially the speech language pathologists, but we should always break the speech jargon into terms so parents, caregivers, and all providers in early interventionists fully understand what it means for the child. An articulation delay or disorder can involve one or more sounds. It encompasses speech sound substitutions. We hear that we hear those a lot in young children's speech. Maybe they say, you know, a, a B for a P, or omissions, leaving sounds out, 
or just distorting sounds. Articulation of speech comprises the use of what we call speech articulators. Those are our lips, our tongue, our jaw, our vocal folds, and as this picture portrays, let's not forget about those cheeks. I bet many of you have seen kids with chubby cheeks like this, and there's little to no movement. Cheek activation or movement is critical in speech. Articulation is very fine motor oriented. It involves using muscles simultaneously in a rhythmic and coordinated effort. Co-articulation exists in speech. That is, moving from one sound to another in single words up to conversation level. So how we use those muscles really impacts the way we form our speech. It happens very, very fast. So for all of you SLPs, I know these terms will sound familiar, place, manner, and voicing. For others, just to define these, place means where the sound is made in the mouth and what articulators or the muscles, again, or the, um, are involved. Manner has to do with the constriction and the degree of narrowing in the oral cavity. So for example, a B or a B is called a stop as all airflow is constricted or stopped by the lips. You might try that. And then voicing, air passing through the vocal folds to create vibration. So some sounds are voiced as in B and other sounds are voiceless as in P. On a basic level, we can demonstrate sounds with children and parents to, in, to increase understanding of how sounds are made and what articulators are involved. I may refer to a sound as a quiet sound or a noisy sound, or I may use other verbal cues such as use your lips and open your mouth without getting technical that the sound is actually called a voiced bilabial stop. So as a brief overview, we're going to discuss where speech originates in the brain. So the prefrontal cortex. So I felt it was important to highlight some research as what we do in early intervention should be supported by evidence and research. Hence, evidence-based practice. And even though you may feel you're back in neuroscience or anatomy and physiology in the next few slides, I felt it was critical to review a few facts as it relates to, to the development of speech. It is helpful to explain to parents the basics of how speech is produced, and especially if other medical complications or language difficulties exist. So the prefrontal cortex is where speech originates in the brain. So the function is critically important to produce speech. And, there, and here is where other cognitive activities exist, such as reasoning and planning and judgment and attention. Let's note here on, as growth for cell connections in the prefrontal lobes develop slowly throughout ch childhood and do not reach maturity until adolescence. So it's important to point that out as children mature at different rates. So Broca's area. This may sound familiar. This is specific to speech production, the area in the brain. And its function and location is that it is in the left frontal hemisphere that controls speech. And just knowing where speech is controlled may make sense for others, especially for those children, again, that have underlying medical issues. Here, again, it talks about the growth and, of, and density of cell connections in Broca's area. And I found it interesting with the development of speech that the growth of cells is not peaking until 15 months of age. So think about that in relation to, to speech development and production. OK, 
Okay, moving on with a little bit more research. How many times have you evaluated an infant under six months of age? And parents, maybe they weren't really concerned about language, but maybe the service coordinator, you know, was in the intake was finding out that, oh, they're really not babbling yet. Maybe we need to have speech here. But when you get there, or even in the, in the community, how many times have you been asked, you know, what do you do? You're a speech therapist. My child's not talking yet. So, but, they, but you need to explain long before infants say their words. They are acquiring communication skills that form the foundation of language. During their first months, infants demonstrate that they are social beings. They gaze into the eyes of their caregivers, and they are sensitive to the tones of the voices around them, using facial expressions with those whom they are interacting with. They pay attention to language spoken to them, and they begin to take turn in conversation, even if it's just vocalizations such as cooing sounds. So children, as Bernthal and Bingston demonstrate here in their research, and, and there are stages of early vocal development. The first one is reflexive and cry vocalization, and it's observed during the first month of life. And then we move into the cooing and gooing stage in which basic syllable shapes, you know, consonant vowel production, the back vowels and even back consonants are produced. And that's usually between two and three months of age. At this stage, children can distinguish between their mother's voice and, other, and another's voice between utterances. Then we move into the expansion stage, which is more vocal play, squealing, growling. We have the babbling stage, consonant vowel combinations, around six months. And then as we move in past the babbling stage, Around eight months, we get more strings of syllables, more sounding like what we call jargon, adult intonation patterns, moving to the single word production, and around 12 months of age, those first words come in. I thought this was interesting in relation to what we do in EI and what we teach. Um, these are excer excerpts from McLeod and Beal from ASHA 2003, and you'll note the importance of brain development and environment, that the child's brain is shaped by the environment. And isn't that what we are teaching parents, to expose their child, to give them experiences that shape what the child is learning? So according to research, the potential to learn in a variety of contexts to, and then, that you can learn in a variety of contexts and then carry over into the actual living arrangement. So we have many children that are in daycares and we are encouraging them to, you know, go and be involved in community activities. So I, I thought that that was very interesting and how children can adapt, and that's what we're teaching them, to expose them to different environments. Let's move on to assessment of articulation in early intervention. We often see children referred with the parental concern regarding his or her child's speech. Again, remember, those terms seem to be used interchangeably, and many times the referral is for language, not speech, and is, it is important to distinguish the difference. Other times, parents are expressing concerns about not being able to understand their child. So often, there's a language delay, but there can be an articulation component interfering with the child's ability to express him or herself. Therefore, the two can coexist. As speech language pathologists and as initial evaluators, you are the first to see the child and must be prepared to assess not only the child's language but also articulation. For SLPs, being the ones that 
evaluate. The Boldman First Doe test of articulation is, an, is a DHS approved testing tool to use within the EI program. Sometimes this standardized test is attempted with the child, but given the child's compliance or for other reasons cannot be completed, therefore an informed clinical opinion must be utilized to determine eligibility. That is, if an expressive language delay or disorder does not exist. Remember, in early intervention, if the assessment tool does not show at least a 30% delay or more, then a statement to support eligibility must be written. And let's also remember, a child is eligible for early intervention, not the specific service. The services are determined at the IFSP. So it is critical when we talk about speech sound acquisition to have a strong understanding of speech sound development. As we consider brain development and the degree of variability impacting speech development, we look to research for what sounds are developed based on an average. The following slides are charts, they're references in which we can refer to to explain sound development and what is expected across initial, medial, and final positions of words. This visual depicts sounds that should be mastered by these ages or a delay is considered. So we're really targeting, you know, by three, those sounds, the wa, ba, pa, ha, m, and n, are sounds we would expect to be mastered by the age of three. So the next slide, again, is about speech sound development. And this is, this is from the Golden First Joe Test of Articulation. I'm sure many of you have seen it, at least um, the speech pathologist on the, on the call. So for purposes of for the toddlers and the children that we see under the age of three in early intervention, we would concentrate on the columns related to age two. You'll notice early developing sounds across all positions, again, the initial, medial, and final to be um, the ones that I had mentioned earlier, the mm, mm, pa, and ba, and ha. And, and I think I see a lot of children, you know, having the wa sound, and it's a sound that I generally target just because it really helps with lip rounding and movement. Um, and then the d in initial position is also listed in this chart. And if you think about it, da da is one of the first words a child uses. So just note the different positions. And these are very helpful tools to explain to parents as well, you know, what sounds should my child be, you know, exhibiting. So again, this chart is, is the same information, it's just in a different format. And to comment on, um, you know, like I said, being very aware and explaining to families, explaining to other providers what sounds should you know, this child be exhibiting, um, because parents often express concerns about sounds that are much later developing, like the R, the L, the S, the TH. These are later developing sounds, but they can impact speech intelligibility or how well a child is understood. So I often tell families, you know, we're really not concerned overly concerned about those sounds, it doesn't mean that you can't model them and show them how they're made. And two, we have to be aware of cultural differences as to whether, as to whether those English sounds are even present in the child's primary language. So you may have other charts or references that you use, and you can certainly share those with um, the moderators if you'd like to, you know, share. That, that would be great. Shauna, Shauna, yes. this is Maria. 
I would like to interrupt you for just a second. We did have a couple questions that seem like they fit pretty good here. Um, there was a question from Maria about if you could just clarify again what the um, what do you mean by initial sound? Okay, those are the sounds that occur in the beginnings of words, like b in ball. And then um, there was some question about is this the same for all kids or only English speaking children? This is for English speaking. Again, you have to be aware if that sound exists in the primary language. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when assessing a child, there are atypical red flags that signal difficulties and may indicate an articulation disorder. So as I have here, numerous vowel errors. So we do need to pay attention to that. We need to listen to see how, how are the vowels impacting how the child is pronouncing words and being understood by others. We often see what we would um, call vowel distortion that can really impact how well that child is, is heard or that message is communicated to others. Other red flags would be, again, you know, saying the initial consonants. Those are the sounds that occur in the beginnings of words. So frequent deletion, just it's not there. They may be saying, you know, all for ball, um, op for pop. That, those are just a couple of examples. So, you know, those are sounds, again, that we should be hearing, you know, um, depending on the age of the child. But, you know, by age three, those initial early sounds should be present. So this would be an atypical sign. Another uh, would be frequent use of what are called glottal stops, like an H, a H huh sound occurring before the beginnings of a word. Um, and then also a very common um, substitution would be backing, you know, a coup for two, uh, buy for, or die for buy, things like that, which may be an atypical sign that you should be aware of. Another common one um, that we see in toddlers is final consonant deletion. And what that means is leaving off the ends of words. Duh for duck, buh for book, ju for juice. So depending, again, on the age of that, that child, um, I will say, you know, we expect the final consonant deletion to um, be gone, if you will, by the age of two. Another um, atypical sign, and I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times, is speech intelligibility. So sometimes the child will be cooperative and attend to a test, but other times he or she won't. So we really need to consider taking a speech sample within the play-based assessment. So speech intelligibility is how well that child is understood. These are just atypical signs. Other atypical signs? that are important to note. And as, as a speech language pathologist, again, assessing the structure and function of the oral musculature is very important. An oral examination should be conducted as tolerated. <laughs> we know how difficult that can be sometimes with little ones. Um, and then and I, I think another important thing here is Enlarged tonsils could, you know, could cause a child to be a mouth breather. It's important to observe how the child holds his jaw, his tongue, her, or her tongue at rest. A protruded or a tongue pushed forward at rest could be a sign of a structural or a functional difficulty. And, and functional meaning there could be um, 
muscle, low muscle tone um, that may impact speech. So low muscle tone or weakness of the articulators may exist, and you could have drooling. You could have difficulties in coordination of movement and or paired, you know, with speech. So you can have difficulties with coordination just moving the tongue side to side or when making the sounds is what I mean. You can have difficulties with imitation of speech sounds when the sounds are produced by themselves in syllables, sequencing of syllables that's, you know, moving from one sound to another, difficulties imitating words, uh, words that have more than one syllable, moving from phrases to sentences to conversation. Another atypical sign, and you should be aware and observing for this, would be another structural deficit. Um, a parent may not be aware that the child is tongue-tied. Or the labial frenulum, that's the connection and under the upper lip between your gum and your lip. So I definitely have seen these um, quite often. Um, so you have to, you know, really do that oral mechanism screening as you can. You want to ask about difficulties with eating because, you know, e and even with breastfeeding because, these, you know, it's important to gather um, a comprehensive history because it can impact articulation. So given the restricted movement of either the lips or the tongue. And again, I just mentioned, gathering a detailed medical history and being aware of what diagnoses a child has and whether it is typical or atypical of those diagnoses to have speech impairment, such as Down syndrome, cerebral palsy. We know that often we will see some difficulties um, with, you know, the children that, you know, have Down syndrome or cerebral palsy um, do, just because of their, of their medical diagnoses. So um, it is important also to know about the hearing, the audiological assessment results, whether a child has a history of ear infections, allergies, and just overall health that can impact articulation. Shauna, I would like to interrupt you here for just a moment. We've had a lot of discussion on our chat about um, the glottal stop, and if you could give more um, examples of what that is, maybe go into a little bit more detail about the glottal stop. The, um, well, the huh sound is, I just mentioned, I was seeing in, some, in the chat room here, the huh sound, you know, I've seen children really using the huh before a particular word. The glottal stop um, being like the K's and the G's, um, so the more of the back throat sounds. When we say glottis, it's more the level of, you know, the, the back of the throat or the, um, the vocal folds. So they occur in the back. Hopefully that helps. Okay. Well, um, if there's any other questions, we'll, we'll catch you um, as we keep going. So thank you. Okay, so I mentioned earlier vowel distortion, and I think this is something that is often overlooked as a difficulty as, when we, as consonants are generally the focus, especially um, for parents and for other providers, you know, who aren't as familiar with um, speech acquisition. Um, but really, you know, vowels are the first sounds that are acquired. And we, the babies, you know, are developing those vowel sounds early on. So as they begin to, de to produce consonants and having to pair them with vowels, making consonant vowel and vowel consonant sequences, we, we will see at times distortion. You know, it's, it's not clear. Those are, they're produced in a different way. And so it can, impact how well that child is being understood. This is just a visual that, um, you know, that shows where certain sounds are made in the mouth and 
Um, when we talk about vowels, it's more about the height of the tongue, the backness, the rounding of the mouth to produce the vowels. So give it a try, and can, you know, at home and try to, you know, feel where those, where those vowels are made in the mouth. So just a nice reference for you. And there's it notes here. They are reasonably accurate by age three. Okay. So speech intelligibility. Again, this is how well a child's speech is understood and we should consider by both the familiar and unfamiliar listener. And to what extent is it understood? So it's speech clarity or the proportion of a speaker's output that a listener can readily understand. In typical development, as children learn to talk, what is understood steadily increases. A key characteristic of children with speech sound disorders is that, is that they are often significantly less intelligible than those non-speech impaired children of the same age. In young children, there's often a, a marked difference between single word production and conversational speech and intelligibility is, is different between close family members and those unfamiliar listeners. And as we know, context and um, the, the conversational topic, if you will, it definitely varies. Um, so context often helps us to understand young toddlers. And sometimes siblings may be more adept than parents in comprehending what their little brothers and sisters are saying. So to gain the best picture of a child's speech intelligibility, remember to get a speech sample within a play-based, fun, and motivating situation. Inquire with parents and caregivers about what they are hearing in their child's speech and ask for specific examples. A lot of times, you know, we do have to rely on, you know, what is the parent telling us? So it's a combination of what you observe, what the parent tells you to make the best um, decision about whether you think, you know, it's really impacting our, the, uh, the articulation and how, and, and whether early intervention services would be warranted. Remember what sounds are expected for children under three and try to measure how intelligible they are to you as the unfamiliar listener as well as a, a familiar listener. And you are, and as a speech language pathologist, you're a trained listener. So it's, it's a little bit different than, um, you know, an aunt who never sees the child, you know, on, or not never, but on, a, on an occasional basis. Okay. So I thought it would so, be, um, go ahead. Okay, yeah, so it looks like this is a good time for us to do a poll. And the question um, posed to you all is, how intelligible should a child's speech be at 24 months? So find that little um, poll box with the little A in it or a check mark and enter in your answers. And for those of you who are asking some questions, we've got a place here in just a few minutes where we'll be able to answer, um, um, get, get some answers from Shauna on some of the questions you've been asking. So but as we go, let's see what folks are coming up with as far as when intelligible, how intelligible a child's age should be. Answers are still rolling in. Folks, a few more seconds. Okay, looks like we've got most of our responses here. Let's see what we came up with. So, um, over 62 percent uh, of you responded that you felt the child's uh, intelligibility should be at 50 to 75 percent. 
Um, and uh, it looks like um, that seems to be the vast majority of answers. Some of you um, didn't, weren't really sure or uh, just a few thought 25 or 75, but most of you answered 50 to 75 percent. So, Donna, what do you think? Well, let's see what the experts say here. <laughs> so measuring speech intelligibility. There's a nice little formula that uh, flips in um, has designed, and this this came from um, a study from Coplin and Gleason, but it's used by other SLPs as a guide to the expected conversational intelligibility, intelligibility levels. So this is a nice little um, formula. So it looks like you guys were right in line with um, what the experts say. Um, around two years of age, but I would say about 50%. As you approach three, it's more like 75 to 80% of speech should be understood by others. But this is a nice way to, to measure speech intelligibility. And there, and here again, another study, as you note, at 18 months, it's 25% intelligible. And, and as we all indicate, most of us indicated, about 50 to 75%. Again, there's definitely a range of intelligibility, and depending on that um, context, and these measures are definitely subjective, so it will vary. Um, I believe that completing, I mean, as, especially um, as you get to know a child more, completing multiple speech samples, or even um, today with iPhones and the technology we have, there's been many times, you know, if, if a mom or a dad has provided a recording for me during the evaluation, so it was the perfect way to get a, a, a natural speech sample. So I think taking an average over speech samples, you know, really does help and assist with accuracy. Um, and but not always when we're when we are. Um, in there doing our evaluations, it's that one snapshot. So trying to gather as much information as possible. Um, and then I think as you get more comfortable with this, or, or maybe you already are, and you would agree that adapting a consistent measure for yourself is most helpful. Another um, concept is, is stimulability. And this is um, measuring the child's ability to produce or um, imitate a sound in one or more contacts. So you want to look at how stimulable, how, you know, if you say a sound, can they produce that sound back successfully, looking at it in different positions of words, and, I, and by itself, in a syllable, in a word, in a phrase. And this will help you determine how much cueing is necessary to achieve the best production. So do you need to just give them an auditory model? Do they just need to hear it? Or do you need to provide an auditory and a visual model? Do you need to provide a tactile mod model as well? So stimulability testing, you know, is, is definitely used to determine if the sound would likely be acquired without intervention, select appropriate, you know, it helps you select appropriate targets for your intervention, and it helps predict improvement in therapy. All right, well, this seems like a good place to stop and ask um, some questions. And let's see, we've had, um, the question about do these um, kiddos who, with uh, hearing loss who get cochlear implants typically develop speech the same way as their hearing peers? And the second part of that is what has been your experience? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, I think it's going to, you know, depend on that child. I actually have a, a child that I, I'm, I'm starting to see that just had a, um, a cochlear implant and the second one activated, and 
you know, I'm finding that I, I'm really having to use a lot, a lot of visual. And um, I think that they do. I'd have to see what research says about that. As I'm working with this child, I feel like I'm, I'm really learning as well along the way what works for that child. Um, I think, you know, every individual is different. Um, but I, I would think that the sounds do develop as they're beginning to hear them and get comfortable with them. Um, I know with this particular child, one was turned on initially, so they started hearing sounds and getting used to the sounds in the environment. Um, and then as the second one is has just been activated, um, you know, he he definitely is attentive to sounds. He's hearing the sounds. Producing the sounds is a different thing. But um, I think he's very responsive, you know, in looking and engaging and trying to um, produce the sounds in the same way that we would as, as hearing as uh, hearing people do. Okay. Paula has some questions about your thoughts on infants who don't babble and when there is no medical history or diagnosis. Well, we do see that happen. Um, you know, you just have to you just have to guide, you know, the family along the way. You have to see what works. You have to see as the child is getting older, you know, are they able to imitate speech? Is there anything, again, um, structurally or functionally um, different about the child? Are they having difficulties uh, coordinating speech sounds? You know, just to figure out the underlying reason. It's not always cut and dry um, as to why a child, you know, hasn't babbled. So you just really have to move along as as you're, you know, working with the child and the family, and you may identify things along the way. There may be motor components that are also, you know, impacting the child. We, we, we talked about low tone. So um, I think consulting with other other providers is also helpful. Karen has some concerns um, with some of the information as to whether or not a lot of children would become qualified um, for articulation therapy, and have you seen a lot of children become qualified um, for that, whether appropriate or not? Um, that's hard to say what others are doing. Um, I've, you know, I try to use everything that I know about speech development, everything we've talked about so far to make the best determination. Um, you know, and, and I have personally, you know, again, just speaking for myself, I have seen um, children that, you know, the, the family was very concerned, but yet the sounds were very, um, you know, they are developmental, and there were sounds that really weren't impacting the child's speech so much. They, they were putting words together. Um, they had all the early sounds. You know, it just, you have to look at the age. There's all of the things to consider, um, you know, whether a child is eligible. And I've gone and I've done, I have made a child eligible and I've not made a child eligible. You know, I, it just, it is unique to the situation. So. I've got a couple more questions and then we'll move on. Um, Shanna wants to know about uh, what about a child who really has no sounds at 18 months but a lot of laughter. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's interesting. Um, well, I mean, I think that, you know, there definitely should be some of those early sounds coming on. We should be seeing babbling. We should be seeing at 18 months jargon. We should be, you know, hearing 25 to 30 words. There's a there's a range. <laughs> That's an average. Um, so there definitely should be some, you know, at 18 months. So I would be concerned. Looks like maybe one more question here. Do you often request parents to get hearing tested when there are so many sound errors? That's yeah. from Janet. Mm -hmm. All yes, right. 
These are really good questions and we really appreciate the thoughts, the fact that you all are kind of responding to each other as well. Um, if I've missed any, um, just retype them again. There were quite a few and we'll catch them on our next break. So um, with that said, I'll let you kind of move on, Shauna. Okay. So what is typical of a toddler? When do we begin to be concerned about articulation? And just like the question at 18 months, I mean, the answer isn't cut and dry. As parents, as providers, as interventionists, you know, we need to ensure the child is acquiring speech and language along the developmental trajectory, vowel production, cooing, babbling, production of duplicated syllables, moving to varying consonant vowel sequences, vowel consonant sequences, until those single, you know, words are produced around, around 12 months of age. But, and a lot happens with language development from 12 to 24 months. And it is usually around two years of age that, I mean, how many referrals have you had around two years of age? A child is having difficulties not only using speech sounds, um, but also putting, putting words together. So I think around two years of age, if you're, you know, you're seeing a lot of difficulties, as we mentioned earlier, the omissions of sounds, deleting sounds and words, substitution, and as the length of utterance expands, having difficulty with speech in intelligibility. So if we bear in mind, again, all of the atypical signs, considering all the aspects of oral motor and sensory development, language development, and what is expected of that child, you know, for speech sound acquisition, I think we have a solid guide to understanding what is typical. So here's um, a case study. I wanted you to take a minute to look at this information. And what we, from what we've learned thus far in relation to sound normative data and development as well as intelligibility, would you consider this child eligible for early intervention? And then we're going to take a poll. We'll give folks a few minutes to sit there and, and uh, read the information. And then when you have an opportunity, go ahead and open it up your polling icon, which is the last four, the last of the four icons under your name, and identify whether you believe this child would be eligible, um, yes or no. Responses are coming in. Thank you. Give folks a few more seconds to complete their, their thoughts. still coming in, so I'm going to wait until I see it slow down here. So looks like I think that might be where we are. So what did you decide? Did you decide if this child was going to be eligible or not? And an overwhelming uh, number, 85% of you, decided that you thought this child would be eligible. So, um, right. Shauna, what's, uh, what's your thoughts? Whoops, let me back up. Ellen no should see that. <laughs> okay, so um, I would agree. I mean, where, where the standard scores on the Goldman Cristo, you know, were right at low average, and average mean being 85 to 115 on the um, test. 
there's, um, you know, can first looking at this is a 30 month old and what would we expect a 30 month old to be doing? And right away, you know, I was thinking, well, they're having difficulties imitating three word phrases and multisyllabic words. Um, in a 30 month old, we would expect to be putting together, you know, four or five word, um, sentences. And where they did have a lot, of, this child had a lot of the early sounds in the single word, um, was that modeled? Was that spontaneous? Um, there's still multiple sound substitutions for later sounds. Um, report of the daycare having difficulty, the drooling, the difficulties with coordination. There was a lot of um, signs that would definitely atypical and um, would warrant and be eligible for services in my mind. So I do agree. Oops, am I moving that? Okay. So the next one, here's an example of a child with an articulation disorder currently receiving um, services. So take a look here and note, and note that this is a 32-month-old boy, you know, so approaching three years of age. And some of the things that I had mentioned, there's some classic, you know, atypical signs. You know, mom reported, you know, difficulties with breastfeeding due to the tight labial frenulum. History of a couple of ear infections, um, not chronic ear infections. He does use 100 or more single words or approximations. And approximations meaning it sounds like the word. It's not quite clearly articulated. He's beginning to use two word phrases. Well, he's 32 months old. So, you know, that's definitely, um, you know, concern there. And he uses a lot of jargon. His parents understanding 75% of the time, but others only 50%. He's becoming frustrated. Um, and this is a child that actually qualified based or for early intervention based on a, an expressive language delay um, and then articulation coexisted. So just another example for you. I thought this was a very uh, powerful quote. I think it summarizes what we strive to do in early intervention, that we empower the family. And I believe that communication and its success relies heavily on the communication partner. So it's our role to teach and coach families and provide them with meaningful strategies to incorporate within daily routine. In my mind, each and everything that we do is communication. So it should be easy, right? Well, not really. When a parent hears that a child has an articulation delay or a disorder, you know, or there's going to be a speech therapist coming to their home, I think the first instinct, you know, that they, they ask is, what can I do? What can I buy to help him and her? You know, what kinds of things can I get? And it doesn't come natural to parents. And they think they have to sit down and do flashcards and drill. But learning is most meaningful in context. So through exposure, natural experiences, modeling, and repetition, children learn best. In fact, we all learn best that way, right? So let's talk about some strategies that make sense. These would be strategies for you as the early interventionist and for the family. Remember, in EI, we should be coaching, guiding, and teaching the family and encouraging families to incorporate speech, language, and communication into everyday routines. I found, um, <laughs> I found this as I was researching, and I, I thought this acronym really made sense. Um, we're going to find out about, you know, what it means. It originated in the UK, so you'll see nappy time being referred to, and just remember that that's not nap time. It's actually diaper changing. So let's find out, um, you know, what it 
what it uh, means. But as you see here, you know, it's, it's talking and listening and responding to your baby. Remember how we talked about infants and how communication starts very early on. So we want to definitely um, interact and develop a good foundation for communication. So H, happy. Remember to be happy. And again, this is diaper changing. This is a this is a time that these moments happen very often for babies. How many times do you actually have to change a, di a, a diaper for a baby in a single day? So make it an opportunity to communicate and connect and interact with the baby. E is being expressive. We know babies are active learners, and they're learning through their environment and their senses. So using facial expressions and being expressive as you, as, and happy um, to enjoy, you know, interacting with your child. Being loving. It's it, diaper changing. It is. It's an intimate time. Um, attachment and interaction are critical to developing social skills and communication. Loving, of course, <laughs> and then to prepare. Um, if you think about it, um, you, you know, you can apply this to every situation. Let's bring me back up, sorry. You can apply this to every situation. I tell my families to be happy, animated, to exaggerate speech, and to be face-to-face -face with direct eye contact and bringing attention to your mouth, using the senses to learn. As I said, being loving, being positive and patient with children is also key and works best with toddlers. Preparing this last one, that isn't always easy, but as young children learn through experience, I think we can adapt this to every situation, try to prepare them for the situation, talk through the situation, and describe everything around them will help create a positive learning experience. So let's discuss some other strategies specifically related to articulation. So sometimes a child can feel pressured and will avoid interaction if they think there's too much of a challenge. So the interventionist and the caregiver need to establish a plan that doesn't feel threatening. You want to create a fun and rewarding environment. The traditional drill of speech sounds isn't fun for children, and nor do I find it very entertaining. So <laughs> trying to be creative and fun, uh, the more likely for success. So take a look at some of the strategies here. You want to guide the family, again, with, you know, explaining what sounds are expected. You want to discuss those family routines and have an understanding of what they do on a daily basis. You want to identify those moments of greatest interaction. We talked about the diaper changing. There's meal time. There's, you know, all sorts of interactions that happen frequently throughout the day. Have the family target a sound of the week. Build those sounds into interactions. Again, it's not sitting down and doing flashcards, and, and it's making it natural in everything that they do throughout the day. You can suggest select target words and have them use them throughout the day because repetition is definitely um, something that works. And modeling good speech, exaggerating speech sounds, and then you might, if you say, you know, you're reading a book or whatever activity, you might make a list of those common words that the child uses and model them back. Other strategies, you know, again, find out about that routine, snack, meal time. What a great way to incorporate working on those oral movements and speech sounds using crunchy and chewy foods will alert the mouth and will provide an opportunity to work those speech muscles. Be playful with food. Make things out of food. Talk about the, the steps, you know, involved is maybe they're making a homemade pizza. And you could target, as I mentioned earlier, target a word, target a sound. Um, maybe it's Play-Doh. You're making animals. Play a game in the mirror. 
making faces, um, brushing teeth is not a great time to incorporate facial expressions. Um, lip, you know, I've, I've suggested at that same time using chapstick, making lip prints on the uh, mirror, using cereal at snack time, um, picking up picking up the cereal with the tongue tip and seeing who can hold it the longest. Um, going outside, playing hide and seek, you know, building in games that are motivating and familiar to the child. Um, bottom line, make it fun, practical, and productive. Other strategies, reading, reading is great. Making a list of the words in the book and throughout the day, talk about what story you read. Recall those favorite stories and target sound words. Today's world is full of, you know, technology. Using the computer, using apps. Uh, there's so many out there that, you know, kids are motivated by. Finding objects that target the sound around the house or while driving. Talk about your child's favorite character, toys, what they did at the sitters, the daycare. It's talking about everything throughout the child's day. Um, and most anything can be adapted to incorporate speech sounds. This is an article that I thought um, would be interesting for you guys to read. It's a study revealing an increase in speech problems or difficulties over the last decade. And if you look at it, um, and on the ASHA website, in late 2013, they launched an Identify the Signs campaign, which um, is a public announcement, and it helps inform parents, you know, about um, speech and language disorders. So it's, it's great, and, you know, when you're, you know, as, out there as an early interventionist to share this information with others. I thought it would be a nice resource for you. And last but not least, we want to involve all the communication partners that a child has. Working as a team is the best approach to success. This includes parents, caregivers, sitter, daycare provider, grandparents, and other early interventionists. We should all be on the same page. Sharing with others involved in the child's life will make it most meaningful and successful. So as another provider, talk to, you know, the speech path. Find out what they're, what they're doing. See what you can do to help. So if you're the physical therapist and you know that the speech therapist is concentrating on and the family is concentrating on, you know, particular words for the week, maybe incorporate that B sound or those B words while you're walk, going up the stairs or bouncing on a ball. If you're the DT, you know, incorporate those sounds, the, the M sound, while you're doing a turn-taking activity and, and encourage me and mine and think about, you know, be creative with what your word choice is. To, for everyone to be on the same page. So the more we work together, the better. So I think this slide says it all, with and without words. And I hope that you gained information about articulation and sound acquisition, what's typical and atypical, and strategies that you can apply. Thank you. All right, Shana, we have a couple of questions here before we wrap up. Um, Kara had a question about what age would you recommend a family evaluate their infant for speech delay? An infant for speech. Depending, um, again, if they're not babbling, and that may be more about language. Um, it's going to depend if there's a medical history. Um, again, we've got if for an infant, we've got language development, but we should also be seeing those early speech sounds. So it really is going to vary. If they're not babbling by six months, I would be looking to see, you know, possibly having a speech evaluation. Debbie wants to know if there is a certain age where articulation is not able to be addressed. Hmm. That's a good question. I think you can always address it. 
um, I think it's good, you know, even if a child, you know, isn't necessarily working on specific sounds, that you should be modeling them. I mean, at, I understand maybe you're talking about above, you know, school, in school age. Um, I have seen, you know, children just, they don't develop the sound. They don't get it. But there's there could be other things going on. But early on, we should be modeling and working on it always. Um, there, there's another question, but as before I ask this question, I just want to point out there's a lot of great suggestions that are coming in on chat on various strategies and applications that can be used. Um, but Katie has a question about if a child consistently makes the same sound for a word such as bumpa for grandpa, is that considered an approximation and does that count as a word when counting number of words the child has? It's definitely meaningful. In terms of counting words, I would count it. There's a difference between a meaningful word and the articulation of a word. Eventually, they will, you know, get the correct pronunciation. So, yes, yeah, I would count it. Right. It's, consist um, it's there, consistent. <laughs> yeah. Um, there were some uh, some folks that are offering some resources to uh, individuals. So um, if that's the case, you can uh, share that in, uh, with these other individuals at another time. And um, I'm not seeing anything else in the questions. Um, we really do want to thank you. This uh, The recording of this will be up um, in the future on our website. Join our Facebook page and you'll see the announcements. And hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Thank you very much.